again, to, to reiterate, I'm Diane Dobson with the Renton Chamber of Commerce. We have Angela Beard, who is our nonprofit, I will say, expert. Um, she is the beholder of the most knowledge. So um, we have, this is this is her arena of expertise. Literally she acquired, teaches right? nonprofits how to become self-sustainable. And we have asked her how to create nonprofits. And um, Angela, without further ado, I will pass the mic over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. And good evening, everyone. This Thanksgiving week. Um, thanks for taking some time to be with us and learn more about starting a nonprofit. As Diane said, I am Angela Beard, and I'm with the Fundraising Academy at City University of Seattle. And our mission, which sometimes I still don't believe it after even four years of working there, is to help nonprofits significantly increase their fundraising capabilities. And the, well, because why we want them to have more impact in their communities and society. So literally, I get paid to teach fundraising and nonprofit issues to folks who are working in the field or thinking about working in the field or volunteering in the field or what have you. Um, a little bit more about me. So you know I'm legit. I uh, have been fundraising since 1990, which is a scary, scary prospect. Um, I started as a grant writer and I spent most of my career in the arts and then I went to grad school because I hadn't suffered enough and got my master's in arts management and a MPA and a PhD in public administration. And that meant I could teach. I came back to Seattle, started teaching over at Seattle U in 2013 and have been teaching ever since. Um, I raised quite a bit of money when I was active. I still do a lot of pro bono work. Um, I've published a few times and you know, now we're getting into the, working our way down to the least interesting parts of the resume. So. I'll just go on. Uh, my contact information is at the end of this uh, show. Just so you know, you're free to reach out at any time for fundraising advice, bouncing off ideas. If you want me to come talk to your organization, your board, your staff, your, your folks, your tribe, please feel free. That's I get paid to do that. So it's not an imposition, won't cost you much. If anything, um, just some time and hotel rooms if you happen to be in Spokane or uh, <laughs> sorry I'm a, I'm in a holiday mood folks I'm a little bit uh, tearful and I'm always informal so we'll go through this um, feel free to ask questions at any time just because I'm informal doesn't mean I don't know what I'm talking about or that I'm not extremely rigorous in what I'm teaching because I want you all to be the best and take away from this what you need to go out and do your good work um, so what are you going to take away this evening? My goal for you is to know the difference and how you want to approach forming an either a nonprofit, a charitable organization, or both, what the differences are and the advantages and disadvantages. And then we'll go through five paths to creating your nonprofit, the what you have to do with the state, what you need to do with the federal government if you choose to do so. Uh, what you have to do for your human capital, your folks that are usually the, what make up the biggest part of any nonprofit, your planning and your operations. And uh, like I said, very informal, ask questions throughout. There will be a recording and the slides plus the recording will be sent to you as soon as they can be made available later this week or early next. Um, and before we roll, I have to acknowledge that I've heavily borrowed from the handbook Starting a Nonprofit in Washington State, which was co-produced by three wonderful nonprofit support organizations, 501 Commons, Washington Nonprofits themselves, Communities Rising, which is an organization that deals a lot with legal aspects of forming and maintaining a nonprofit, and then the Washington Secretary of State, who you will hear as we start talking, is heavily involved in nonprofit operations, compliance, formation in the state of Washington. All right. Um, any questions before we get going? Anything you want to make sure I address or don't see up here? Go ahead and type or raise, you know, unmute. 
Erica. Oh, Erica. Yay. <laughs> I'm glad you're back. Hooray. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm back. I'm back. I'm in excited. Um, what I oh, I know. I asked Diane, did you guys send out the first session? Um, the slot, I mean the recording. I know I did not. Um, okay. but uh that could that I mean it's not I'm not supposed to, but they could be holding up. I could be holding something up. Let me circle back to Diane about that. And if it's no, my you're fault, not you're not yeah. holding. I don't think did I send you the I slides? Think, it's been a crazy time. Um, we didn't. We don't. We don't have the slides. We can send the slides out. The recording okay. went out. But if for some reason we didn't have your email or registration, make sure everybody puts their. Um, if you didn't receive a copy of the recording, put your information into the chat, and then we'll make sure that you get a copy of that. And I don't remember sending out you guys the slides, so that might be my fault. You'll get them both together once we concluded tonight thank you for bringing that to my attention erica I'm, i apologize and you'll get everything we ever talked about after tonight um but there's something oh that's an email in the chat so i won't uh, stop for a question um like i said i heavily relied on this handbook and i also uh add my own obviously my own ex experience to to it and tell you some stories so let's roll um and let's talk first about incorporating as a nonprofit. now last time you were with us we talked about the issues you have to consider when you're thinking about forming a nonprofit. and now you we're going to assume that you have either decided or are leaning that way for and for the purposes of this conversation we are talking about a nonprofit corporation to be formed in the state of Washington, okay? Nonprofits are governed by the state in which they are incorporated. So the regulations vary for all 50 states. We're talking about Washington. I don't imagine they vary too widely, but I've never really done a, a scan or survey of it. Um, so if you decide to move to California next week, you'll probably be in the same ballpark down there. Um, but just know this is Washington specific. Okay, so what is a nonprofit corporation? It is a corporation, which surprises some people. Um, you know, they, uh, you have to file um, for a business license. You have to, you don't have to pay taxes, but you have to submit the form of the IRS. You know, it, it's, a, it's a business. A private corporation in which no part of the income, this is the important part, no part of the income is distributable to its members, directors, or officers. It is formed to benefit the public, a specific group of people, or the membership of the nonprofit. There are several different kinds of nonprofit corporations, I think nine or 10. We are talking about a 501c3 or a charitable corporation. Um, their you know, private foundations are also nonprofits. For example, the Gates Foundation is a nonprofit, but it is not incorporated under the same as an operating charity, which most of us are thinking about is. One of the big difference between nonprofit um, corporations, a 501c3 to 501c4, is whether or not someone has members. For example, Rotary Club is a, is a nonprofit, but they have members that pay dues. So they are also incorporated a, a little bit differently than is, you know, the Red Cross or the Humane Society or, or whatever, right? Um, so Alex, again, some of these folks with members are your labor unions, Chamber of Commerce, hello, our friends in Renton here, social clubs like your Eagles, et cetera, and business leagues made like the um, City Club, for example. At the state level, and that's what we're talking about right now, the state level where all nonprofits must register, apply, and incorporate, you have to submit an annual report. It is due the last day of the organization's incorporation month, and a reminder is sent to the registered agent, which is part of, the, of your articles of incorporation. A registered agent is a person or organization that will receive notices and do of, of due process, 
um, renewal notices from the state and the IRS, et cetera. It basically is where your place of business is. Um, and we get to more of this later. At least 30 days prior to the required filing date, it costs $10 to incorporate at the state level. Questions about this? There's six chat, but I think they're all email addresses. Let's see, okay, no questions yet. Now, what most of you I think are thinking, maybe because that's what I've lived with all my life, is a charitable organization, okay? Now this is commonly referred to as a nonprofit um, and they are nonprofits, but they are also charitable organizations, okay? And the big difference here is that a charitable organization it may accept, solicit and accept contributions from the general public, okay? So what is it? An entity that solicits or collects contributions from the general public in Washington to be used to support a charitable purpose may or may not be a corporate structure in Washington. This includes organizations that raise at least $50,000 annually or pay anyone to carry out the activities of the organization. So if you have employees, you have to be registered as a charitable organization, okay? Examples of the, of the uh, public purpose are education, health, social service, religious, cultural, and scientific organizations. Remember those because those are the same categories that are required by the IRS for your 501c3, okay? In the state of Washington, the annual requirements are an annual renewal, no later than the last business day of the 11th month after the end of the organization's accounting year. So if your accounting year ends in on December 31st, you need to renew your registration with the state by the end of November, the last business day, November, the 11th month after the end of the organization's accounting year. And to renew costs $40. Everybody clear on the difference between the two? What is it? What's the big difference here, folks? Shout it out, don't be shy, type it in the box. One of these organizations is a nonprofit, the other is a charity. And what is the difference between the two? I'm gonna help you out with some mouse circles. Um, I, oh, I didn't, uh, okay, never mind. No, no, go one, ahead, Eric. One, one, the charitable one um, has employees. Correct. So you and? pay them and you have to raise um, at least $50,000. I mean, 50, 50,000, yeah. Yes. Least, well, least but least. what you're saying there, Erica, is the Subash. Hi, yes. Uh, the amount, I think, is one difference, like 50K or less and 50K or more. Mm -hmm. But um, actually, I have a question about this. Uh, pay anyone to carry out activities of the organization. That means that any uh, nonprofit which has less than 50K uh, of their annual budget, and if there is some employee in it, does that organization need to be registered at a charitable organization? Yes, it, in theory it does. Now, if you're raising less than 50,000 and you have a paid employee, I'm gonna kind of wonder how much you're paying them, but uh, that's not my business. Uh, the theory of the matter is yes, if you have an employee that receives a wage, you have to register as a charitable organization. But y'all, Erica, you touched on the main difference. Does that help? Is that help you? Does that answer your question, Sabash? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, but Erica, you skirted around the issue, but the real difference here, a nonprofit corporation and the charitable organization, the big difference is the charitable organization may solicit and collect contributions, okay? Remember the first one, the nonprofit corporation. So most of the time, but not always, these folks have members and they get their revenue from the membership fees that are paid. A Rotary is a perfect example, right? Rotary does not, Rotary per se does not accept contributions. You pay a monthly membership fee, da, 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 da. Now, just to throw another monkey wrench in there, Rotary has a foundation, which is a charitable organization. And that's who you give your contributions to when you 
decide to give to Rotary. You do not give it to the Rotary Club. Okay, here comes the hands. Yes. Oh, more chat. Okay, more addresses. Sorry about that. A charity, charity, a charitable organization are the ones who may solicit and collect contributions from the general public. Okay. Now I'm going to add even another layer onto it and go in and we'll talk about the 501c3. Okay. 60% of charitable organizations, just a few facts for factoids for you. Subash, talk to me. Oh, actually, I think you know, I uh, forgot to lower my hand. Sorry about that. Oh, no problem. 60% of charitable organizations are also nonprofit corporations. Many providing direct service, human services, education, research, all those things that we mentioned, and both have to follow, follow both sets of requirements to be in compliance with the Washington Secretary of State. So there are two sets, right? Everybody with me so far? One for nonprofit corporations and one for charitable organizations. Often the two are this are both an, an organization is both, excuse me. I don't mean to say the two are one. I got that backwards. Um, but then when you have to be sure to comply with both sets of those requirements, okay. Let's take a little poll here. I think I would be most just type it in the chat. I think I would be most interested in forming a nonprofit corporation, a charitable organization, or an organization that is both. And tell us why you've made this, this choice or think you would make this choice. What do we have going on? Both, Erica, yay. Both, Sunny. What do the rest of you think? I got two out of 13. Talk to me, both, because you can do fundraising, yes. I mean, I'm a fundraiser by trade. I tend towards the uh, uh, charitable organization, of course. Well, actually towards both. Um, but I want to be able to raise contributions. All right. So we must have someone in the room in Renton. Hello. Thank you for translating, Diane. Um, so, so far, the... It's 100% both. All right. Now, once you've kind of decided what form you want to take, you have to, there are five pathways to follow, like I said. Yes, Melissa, we do want to be able to raise money, right? I'll spare you all the talk of the economic model for nonprofits and just go on to tell you about these five pathways. One at the state level, which we've touched on already, federal, people, planning, and operations. There is a lot of overlap and domino effects. It's not linear. Just because I put a, a list of five up here doesn't mean it all neatly goes in order of these five things happening, right? So know that as I go on and understand I'll be talking a little bit about the interplay as well, okay? So far, so good. Everybody with me? All right. So the state we've talked about quite a bit already, but here is the literal list of what you have to do to register in the state of Washington to, to be a nonprofit corporation, okay? You need to figure out your name and search for it. There's a site at the Secretary of State where you can search on business names, okay? File a name reservation. You need to prepare articles of incorporation and bylaws. So articles of incorporation and bylaws are basically kind of the skeleton, not the skeleton, the, the spine or the backbone of your organization. It sets out in paper and writing how it's going to, where you're going to operate, what your mission is, who you serve, how your board works, conflict of interest policies, um, all kinds of, I mean, kind of the nuts and bolts of your organization, right? It's not a business plan. We get to that later. It is more how you're going to be set up and structured and run, okay? With terms of board members, especially. How big your board can be, what the term limits are, who the officer, not who the officers are, but the officer positions, when you're elected and how, um, if there are term limits and how long they are, what it takes to 
get somebody kicked off the board. Unfortunately, it does happen. Um, all this is spelled out in your bylaws and your articles of incorporation, okay? You then file those with the state of Washington and pay your little fee. With the city of Seattle, you apply for a master business license, just like a business would. We are a business. And if you decide you wanna be a charitable organization, you register with the charities division if you plan on raising funds. Okay, clear so far? The link to this, the workbook, which I took this heavily from, obviously, is at the very end. So don't worry if you're, if you don't need to take notes, it's all in there um, and will be sent to you, I promise. Questions before we go on. This is the state of Washington, remember. Okay, now let's talk about the feds. Well, or we could go more into articles of incorporation. So again, I, I touched on some of this required of all new businesses. Here you go, spelled out. Your name, your purpose, this is your mission, okay? And this is a, a critical step in creating your nonprofit. Your mission statement has to convey how you're going to serve the community, okay? And it has to convey it in a way that, well, I mean, I could obviously give an entire workshop on writing a mission statement, but there has to be a lot of information in there and not too much verbiage, all right? Your mission statement talks about who you're going, the change you wanna see, who you're gonna serve, and if as much as possible, how you plan to serve them, okay? The period of duration usually is indefinite unless you're setting up a nonprofit for a specific period of time. When an effective date, when you incorporated, who your registered agent is, and that usually, like I said, is either the executive director or the board president and their consent. They have to actually sign and say, yes, I will do this. Distribution of assets if you are to dissolve. Return address, which is usually also your registered agent and the incorporator information signature whether it's you know a an attorney helping you or you know a consultant of some kind or you do it on your own um questions this i think it's pretty straightforward but questions so far okay let's move on your bylaws again like i said are your organization's operating manual and they're going to tell you, again, the size of the board and how it functions. What that, by that, it means, you know, how often do they meet? How many meetings are required of board members in order for them to stay active and, and, and compliant? What are the roles and duties of directors and officers? They're pretty standard, you know, across the board. But, the, you know, the president runs the show. The vice president backs up the president. The secretary is responsible for the minutes. Treasurer takes care of the finances. That's my, in a nutshell, completely simplistic explanation of what officers do. It probably varies from organization to organization, and there may be more or less officers. You know, some have a chairman and a president, for example. Um, how you hold your meetings and elections. What are your conflict of interest policies and procedures? How for organizations that are re-granters like United Way or Arts Fund or some of the, uh, um, you know, again, Rotary is another example, how those grant monies get distributed and some other, any other essential corporate governance matters. Questions on by the bylaws or articles of incorporation or the difference between the two? Erica. Is, is there a certain, I mean, when it comes to bylaws, it, it's so, to me, it seems like it's really complex. Um, so is there like a, a, a standard certain amount or, you know, how long it should be? Or is there like some place we could go and just kind of incorporate a few things that kind of- I'm going, I'm going to make you very happy by telling you, you that one of the resources at the end is an entire list of a link to a list of templates. So there are templates there for both articles of incorporation and bylaws, all right? And they're comprehensive as opposed to brief. So you may 
look at this template and decide, you know, this doesn't apply to us or, you know, we're not at that place yet. Bylaws can always be amended. And that's part of what putting you put into your initial set of bylaws to amend these bylaws. We need to introduce a resolution and pass it by a simple majority, half the board, two thirds of the board, whatever. It usually is a higher uh, percentage depending on the importance of the issue, right? But the bylaws can certainly be amended anywhere from when your annual meeting is to how long your term limits are to what the officer structure is. It can all be changed, but you have to have something ready for to incorporate. Does that help? Yes, it does. Awesome. Thanks. Okay, and those templates again are very good. Please use them. I couldn't even sit down and write articles of incorporation or bylaws by myself. You need that as a guide. And this is the kind of thing I'm, that Communities Rising is in business to do. So use those resources to you know get help with this when you're ready. All right. There are also many consultants, and we actually have a very good one in at the Renton Chamber, Linda Akey, who's with Can Do 501c3. She specializes in setting up nonprofits. So if you want to reach out to her, you can find her information through the chamber. Um, federal, at the federal level. Now, to incorporate at the federal level, why would we do this? It's another layer on the contributions thing, okay? In order for contributions to be tax deductible, you must incorporate with the IRS as a 501c3. A 501c3 is the tax exempt organization, okay? The state does not grant that. The state approves you for soliciting and receiving contributions, but it does not make them tax deductible, okay? Vanessa, yes. Um, I have a question about, for example, in our case, we are business, uh, Hispanic business women that we want, you know, to, uh, what to, to be our businesses. We can, uh, of course, we are going to need a board of directors. We can make business with a board of directors, for example, and a bookkeeper. Uh, maybe one of the board of director can be my client. It is possible or there is a conflict of interest, so we need to say something in the bylaws. Do you have your bookkeeper on your board of directors? No, I am bookkeeper, oh, but, sorry. But, but my question is, for example, so we are going to have, um, we are going to become a non-for-profit and in the board of director, one of them is my client. It is possible or maybe I can, I One of them is your, is your what, Vanessa? Sorry, I didn't understand that. No, my client. Your client. Yes. Um, or maybe I can say, okay, she can be my client, but maybe the uh, maybe she can pay me, I don't know, 12000 one year, and after that, uh, she can be my client. I don't know. So you are a bookkeeper, and your, one of your clients would be on your board? Oh, uh, yes. What business are they in? Uh, also, she has uh, like, you know, uh, she provides education services. Okay. In my opinion, that wouldn't be an issue unless you went to her, your organization decided that they were interested in providing education services. That were, that's where the conflict of interest would come in if you, as a nonprofit, decided to use her services and she was on the board. Oh, it's, no, it's very, it's very different. Oh. So it wouldn't be something that would come into conflict? Then I would say no. I mean, you're going to be recruiting and, and asking people you know who have an interest in what you're trying to do and have some knowledge about it or some skills that bring value to the board, why not have your, you know, have okay. your, uh, yeah, sure. Okay. And that's yeah. one of those, again, when you're setting up your bylaws and talking about conflicts of interest, that might be something you'd want to address, you know, uh, what, you know, whose clients or what areas of business or, you know, how do we define a conflict of interest? And how do we deal with it if it arises? Okay. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay, cool. At the federal level, 
at the federal level, you are going to have to, um, you've already done this. Again, there's some crossover here. Find a name, register with the Patent Trademark Office, apply for an EIN. An EIN is the business equivalent of a social security number, okay? That identifies your organization with the IRS. And then you apply for the IRS tax exemption. This is what you have to have in order to be tax exempt and in order to offer tax exemption for contributions to your donors. Does that make sense to everybody? So what do we have going on now? Nonprofit corporations have to register with the state of Washington if they intend to pursue a charitable objective like education, healthcare, health, et cetera. Since they do not plan on soliciting contributions, that is all they have to do. A charitable organization has to register with the Secretary of State as a charitable organization in order to legally solicit contributions and in the state of Washington, okay? Often organizations are both. Now, so far we've gotten you clear to solicit and receive contributions, but in order to get to offer tax exemption to your donors and to be tax exempt yourself as an organization from federal income tax and property tax and all the other kind of things that we don't want to have to pay as a nonprofit, you must incorporate as a 501c3. Okay. That takes six to nine months, I think we discussed last time. Um, it does cost a little bit of money, a couple hundred dollars. About 50% of applications are not accepted. Uh, they're gonna ask you to demonstrate, you're gonna have to have a budget, you're gonna have to have your bylaws and articles of the corporation, you're, which means you're gonna have to have a board. You're going to have to have a strategic plan or a business plan, okay? The IRS wants to see that you are capable of carrying out the work that you are saying you're going to do. It's not an easy process. Um, like I said, six to nine months for your final approval. In the meantime, if you are soliciting contributions from your start as from your very beginning, you've set it right with the state and you're waiting on your 501c3, you may tell your donors that if you receive your charitable, your 501c3 approval, that their gifts are tax deductible retroactively, okay? If you don't, you're taking the chance that their tax deductions are not going to be tax deductible, excuse me, their gifts are not gonna be tax deductible. So be very transparent with any donors you have or get. Once you set up shop, and you have not yet received your 501c3 if you're gonna go that route. Let them know that there is no guarantee that their gifts will be tax deductible, but when you do get approved, then they're deductible retroactively. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So we're all up and running. We've got all of our different registrations in and we've gotten our 501c3 or we were considering a 501c3. Here's a little bit more information about it, 501c3 or not. Now, again, I have a bias here. I'm a big, I'm big into fundraising and grant writing and I wanna be able to do that. So I say, go for it. But here are the uh, pros and cons, okay? Pro, big pro, 501c3 do not pay federal corporate income tax on revenues and contributions are tax deductible to the donor. We went over that. Very important to some donors that they get that tax break on their taxes, okay? So one of the questions to ask yourself is, does or will a current or future funder require federal tax exemption? I'm gonna tell you right now, and we'll talk about grant preparedness in a couple of weeks, that if you plan on writing grants and, and receiving them, Almost all government, foundation, corporate grant makers insist that you have a 501c3. There's no way of getting around it. They will ask you for the letter of incorporation to send with your application. Okay, so that's super important when you're thinking, making this decision. Will your individual donors now or in the future want to be able to deduct donations on their taxes? Some folks don't care. I've worked at 
many nonprofits, obviously, and uh, some organizations I care worked at. The donors were hardcore about they wanted their receipt and they wanted it, you know, everything crossed and dotted so they could so they could deduct from their taxes. And another one, other ones couldn't have cared less. That was more human services, I have to say. Um, you know, you'd send them their receipt or you'd tell them it was late or, you know, whatever. And they, oh, I don't care, whatever, you know. Wow, okay. But you need to know your crowd and know what's going to matter to them when you're thinking about this. What do you all think? Will you or will you not apply for 501c3 tax exempt status? Why? Let me know. T tell me about this in the chat. And ignore my fundraising bias. <laughs> couple of yeses. Excellent. All right. So again, we have uh, an almost 100% so far um, percentage of folks that think of having a 501c3 is important. Frankly, I'm glad. But it can be done, you know, without the 501c3. Sometimes it's just not worth it, right? Um, so, you know, put that in the back of your mind as you consider going forward, and we will move on to talk about some more of the steps you have to take, the pathways. Okay, people. Human capital is usually the most important factor or the most important part of running a nonprofit. Your employees and your volunteers, for many reasons, are um, are the heart of the organization. And from a mercenary standpoint, they're usually the highest expense item as well. So going, going into this thing, you want to start off and do it right. So the organizing group, even before you have incorporated, will adopt, write and adopt board job descriptions. And this is literally just as you would have for a paid position, right? This is what the president does. This is what the vice president does. This is what a regular, you know, director of the board, a member of the board does. This is, you know, here are the responsibilities. Here are the expectations. Here's what, and if you can, and it doesn't always, isn't always possible. Here's what we're, we require of our board members. They have to be committed to the mission. They have to attend a certain number of board meetings every year. They have to give or time, treasure, talent. You know, you need to spell that out. Um, they in, make sure that the board knows to the new board members and future board members knows to the nth degree what's going to be expected of them. And again, I have my fundraising hat on and be sure that you are explicit about fundraising requirements. Boards are responsible for raising money. And a lot of folks shy away from putting that in the job description or when they're recruiting, they say, you know, they don't. They don't, aren't, they aren't upfront about it because they're afraid of scaring people off. That's a big mistake. I'm, I'm here to tell you now that fundraising should be up and front from the very beginning, an expectation of your board members. They are responsible for the fiscal health of your organization, for providing the resources that the nonprofit needs to do its work. All right. So don't tiptoe around it. Let them know what you expect. If it's a personal gift, if it's buying a table at an event, if it's, you know, participating on a fundraising committee, doing thank you, whatever it has, to be, you know, they have to do something, right? Is everybody clear on this? Everybody get the job description thing? Please treat your board members seriously. Uh, this is a little tangent, but there's nothing more frustrating than going onto a board and they welcome you and then that's it. You're not oriented. You're not told what, you know, really told what to do or when to show up or, oh yeah, our board meetings are every three months and you'll get a notice. No, have a full board orientation, you know, get people on board, give them something to do, let them know how much you value them. How, I'll, again, I, I won't go on, but do it right from the beginning, folks. I'm really encouraging you. Troubles with boards are, are the probably the biggest complaint I hear in my work. So, okay, I'm off my soapbox now. Then you're going to have to form your board. And like I said, the minimum in the state of Washington is board member, uh, three board members, 
who are not related to each other. You cannot ask your mother, your sister, and your father to be on your board. You can ask your mother and two of your friends, but you can't have your whole family on your board, okay? You need to determine a registered agent, whether that be um, your executive director, a board president, or you actually can pay people to do this. There are businesses that will. Um, hold your first board meeting. And you're gonna spend a lot of time, like we talked about the last time, in meetings at the, in the first couple of years of your nonprofit and your first board meeting is no exception, okay? You need to adopt a conflict of interest policy. And Vanessa, here's what we're talking about. This is when, you know, do board members excuse themselves when for any any number of reasons you know usually it's about you know business considerations if a board member's business is in the running for something that you are bidding on or that you you know you you intend to carry forward but there are other kinds of conflict of interest policies too and there are examples of them in those templates that i'm giving you set up volunteer roles um and this uh, I can't say much more than that because the volunteer needs of every nonprofit are so different that you're going to have to hammer that out, probably at your first board meeting, um, but in any number of the meetings and, and discussions that you'll have as a new nonprofit, okay? You're going to want to join some of the networks in Washington nonprofits um, as a new nonprofit. For example, um, you know, most sectors have their own networking what do you want to call them, groups. Uh, for example, food banks. All the uh, folks that are in food banks provide are in the, um, there's a food coalition that's run by, there are a couple of geographic ones. There's one in the north end, there's one in the south end, and there's a central one um, where all the food banks get together and share information, they partner on stuff, resources, etc. okay? Search that out and join up. You're gonna need your network, okay? and celebrate. You've done a lot of work. You're in a good position to serve the community. Yay you, right? Any questions so far on this with the people? This is just getting started, okay? Obviously, I'm not describing a full HR operation or the kind of things you'll need to have in place as you grow. Um, this is to get your nonprofit started and off the ground, all right? Clear to everyone? Questions? Okay. Planning. <clears throat> now we come back to defining the mission. Again, I can't emphasize enough, this is a critical part of your creation and your work going forward. Uh, the mission statement gets revised. Um, some, you know, your markets change, your business changes, people you serve change. For um, So yes, you want it to be as good as you possibly can. What does uh, Maya Angelou say? Do the best you can until you know better, then do better. That may be the case with your mission. Do the best you can to talk about who you're gonna serve, how you're gonna do it, perhaps the geographic region, if that's a focus of your work and the change you wanna see in the community, okay? There are millions and millions of templates and articles and books about writing a mission statement. There are consultants who are here to Alaska that will help you. But, and there's a reason for that, it's very important. All right, that is your statement to the community about why you deserve to operate, why you deserve to be tax exempt, um, you know, why they should give you money, et cetera. Set an administrative calendar. Now all that compliance you did with the state and the feds, has to be kept up. So you're going to want to calendar those dates, when all your filings are due every year, when your permits and your renewals are due, and what your annual budget process is going to be, okay? Again, this is a, a nascent calendar. Eventually it's going to expand to have program information and fundraising information and marketing information. All your board meetings will be on there, committee meetings too probably, but to start out, this is the stuff you need. Okay, you know, with all the technology, you, you might want to spend some time talking about what's best for you so everybody can have access to that um, and pay attention to it. You know, make sure that the folks who are taking care of you, these things have access so they know what, what they need to be doing and when. 
Start program design, a business plan, a budget, and a fundraising plan. All right. Yes. You're like, whoa. Oh, that's so overwhelming. Well, yeah, it's a lot of work. Uh, remember, we talked about last time that you'll be spending, you know, most of your time doing this kind of stuff. You need to plan the work and how you're going to pay for it before you actually, well, <laughs> on paper at least, before you actually start doing the work because every, you know, stuff costs money, right? Serving people costs money. So, Designing your programs is going to tell you how much it's going to cost, which is going to tell you how you can raise, how much you need to raise or what you can charge if that happens to be your business. Um, and if you need to go for loans or, you know, show something to your donors, you want all that in a plan. There are business plans for nonprofits. There are also strategic plans for nonprofits. Okay. Business plan. If we're familiar with that. Again, it's your market. It's, you know, the value you're adding, it's how you're going to reach your market. And, um, you know, basically what it's more about sales type than a strategic plan, which is usually over three to five years. And that tells you how you're going to achieve your mission. Okay. Are we going to expand? Are we going to contract? What are our strategic priorities? Do we want to focus on, you know, a lot of folks now, for example, are focusing, putting into their strategic plan incorporating diversity, equity, inclusion, and access into their nonprofits, and their businesses. You know, everybody's, everybody's, you know, realizing that that's an, a growing, important social and, you know, political and cultural and all kinds of things norm it has to happen. How are we going to incorporate that? That's the kind of thing that's in your strategic plan. One of our priorities over the next three to five years is to diversify, to offer equity, whatever you want to call it, by doing X, Y, and Z. This is when we're going to do it. This is how we're going to do it, et cetera. Okay. And develop a work plan. This is a work plan is year one. How are we going to get this thing done in our first year? Um, again, the strategic plan is three to five years. And it's more long-term visionary work plan is... <laughs> We need to write X number of appeals by the end of the year. We need to find a facility to house our school. We need to hire staff. We need to, whatever you need to do in the first year to get the organization up and running. Does that make sense? I'm throwing all these plans at you. There's three kinds, business, strategic, and work plans. They all run together and they all separate simultaneously. Does that make sense to everybody more resources at the end for these okay thank you erica i'm glad i'm doing okay <laughs> all right while we're planning we're going to start with some operational tasks here all right so again we need to select an organization name and a domain name all of you already know that a lot of stuff takes place online now. People expect you to have a website. They expect you uh, usually to be active in social media. So you gotta, that's one of the very first things that you need to, to settle on, you know, to set up an organizational email domain. You wanna open a bank account, you need a separate account. That's one thing worth mentioning that once you incorporate, and we talked about this last time, once you incorporate, whether it's at the state level, the federal level, or both, you are a business and you are expected to act like one, okay? So you can't be putting business funds into your personal account. You need to open a business bank account for all of your business transactions for that nonprofit. You need to set up an accounting system, including a chart of accounts. You need to create an electronic filing system. It doesn't have to be electronic if you're small and poor, all right? You need to have a filing system. And if it ends up being paper at first, that's okay. But it's important that you be able to lay hands on pretty much anything that regular date laters or donors or board members are going to ask for, okay? That's where all your articles of corporation go, your business license goes, your bylaws go your board minutes, your committee minutes. Um, eventually you'll start incorporating fundraising into that, your grant proposals, your appeals, your, your letters to your donors. So uh, do it right from the beginning. 
as long as it's well organized and secure, electronic or paper, you can go either way. I'm probably going to be drummed out of the city for saying that since we're such a technology technological city, but I'm just giving it to you real. Um, start fundraising, okay? And I'm going to stop for a little quiz here. What is the most important thing to do if you start fundraising before you are a 501c3? First right answer gets to leave early. <laughs> I'm kidding you. Because you wouldn't want to leave, right? Erica. You want to let um, your donors know that um, if you become 5013C, that um, they will be, um, uh, you know what I'm trying to say. They, I do. They will get, they will get, um, they will get a... What do we file on April 15th? We get tax, tax exempt. Tax but exempt. If, if, if you don't become 5013C, then they will not be able to. Brilliant. Well done. That is exactly right. Okay. And so, I will forgo my leaving early. <laughs> I can't show, I can't emphasize enough how important that is. You are going to start fundraising as a brand new nonprofit, and you need to let your folks know about the tax deductibility. Okay, so we'll take it for granted. Sabash, you had your hand up. Yeah, so I, uh, I was typing uh, the same thing uh, on my phone, so it took time, so I just raised my hand. Yeah, I basically wanted to say the same thing. Okay, awesome. You guys are getting, you're all getting A's and gold stars because you're doing so fabulously. Um, a word on fundraising that we'll get to more of when we do our grant preparedness workshop, do not be fooled into thinking that you're going to get grants right off the bat, all right? I hear a lot of folks, well-meaning, passionate folks come to me and say, I'm going to start a nonprofit. I'll write a few grants, get some big checks, and be ready to go. No. Grantors do not usually fund organizations unless they've been in business for two or three years. They have to have a history most of the time of providing the service and being successful at it, of achieving their goals, okay? So your initial fundraising is going to be from individuals, almost exclusively, all right? Just let that idea sink in now because that's, that's kind of how it happens, okay? You're gonna keep adopting your key policies, your financial procedures, these are super important. Everything I'm talking to you about, is, I know I'm saying is super important, probably because it all is, okay? So financial procedures, some of those can be as simple as this is how we receive gifts, this is how we acknowledge them, this is how we do our reconciliation, this is how we do our, you know, our bank deposits or whatever. Um, but you've got to put it down in paper. Uh, you have to have an audit trail. Um, you want to be able to show what your policies are so, every, you know, everyone knows that you are running a tight ship. Okay, you're gonna to wanna to talk about document retention. What do you keep and what don't you and for how long? Bank statements, yes or no? Check copies, yes or no? Do they do checks anymore? I don't know. Um, and then again, conflict of interest has to be continually either you know, reviewed, updated at least once a year and certainly distributed to all board members for their signature and approval, okay? You'll need to buy insurance. You want to insure your board. You want to insure your, well, and again, this varies depending on the nature of your business again, but certainly organizations that work with children, that work with high-risk populations, um, animals. I mean, almost any volunteers, you need insurance to cover your volunteers in case one of them gets hurt. Um, you know, your employees are covered by the state, by LNI. Um, but there could be any number of other things to ensure your facilities, if people are living there, you know, all kinds of stuff. So you have to kind of look into that, right? And if you do have employees, that you have to set up your HR systems and payroll. Maybe small at first, you intend to grow, start it off well so that you have a good basis to start on. Questions so far? Okay, so we've gone through your state and federal path. We've gone through people. We've gone through operations. I, did I miss one or is that it? Oh, 
here is, and this is at the, um, this is one of your resources with a link. This is just a, uh, you know, a JPEG that, so I could show you. This is the five pathways, okay? And it's set up so that it's interactive. So you, each of these little blurry <laughs> steps that you need to take on each of these paths, you can see with my mouse, has a link to send you off to the proper office or, you know, the state office, the federal office, the nonprofit that can help you like Communities Rising for you to use. Okay, so that's fabulous. And it will be better than just an image when you actually get it at the end of the show. Okay. Now you're ready. Go forth and, and change people's lives. Okay. That's very, again, this is, you know, the 30,000 foot view but it, I hope, gives you a taste of what you can expect when you go forward with forming your nonprofits, what you have to do, all the boxes to check and resources to help you check them. Okay, so now it is time for questions. We've got six minutes. I didn't think I'd make it, honestly. So please hit me with your questions. Is everybody ready to go and start incorporating right now? <laughs> and if so, if so, why? What are you going to do first? If not, why not? Is there anything I didn't answer for you? Is there anything that kind of freaks you out? For me, I think this has been very helpful and it just gives me a lot to think about and what I need to do. And so I'm excited, but um, I think I'm just kind of pacing myself, just making sure that um, I go through each step and kind of do it and reach out to the resources so that um, I'm not spinning my wheels and doing what I need to do. Okay, well, great. Yeah, it's, it's not, you know, something you can do overnight or, you know, weekend, right? It's a real commitment. Um, and if you are, you know, a little nonplussed by all this and are reconsidering starting a nonprofit, that is okay. Remember, your nonprofit has to add value to the community. It has to bring your clients something that no one else is doing, okay? So starting a nonprofit where the services are already available, eventually one of you is going to go out of business. Um, <laughs> you know, we see it all the time. So really think about it. and. The amount of effort and commitment that you're going to have to put into it, the volunteers you're going to have to recruit, the money it's going to cost you. Um, now you have a lot more information to work with. I seriously, sincerely hope that you're all going to go forward or do what you do and find another way to um, make life better in the community for whoever it is that you want to serve. Um, but uh, if you have any more questions, oh. I don't know what I don't know. Yeah, well, <laughs> get in line, Melissa. <laughs> I don't know what I don't know most of the time, right? Um, yes, I hope it does make sense once you get in and get started, okay? And if you have questions, here is my, here are these wonderful resources, okay? These I, I can't recommend highly enough. Um, here, the, there are the, there's the starting a nonprofit interactive thing we just saw with the five paths is the top one. Document templates here is the second, Communities Rise again, and then the whole handbook, which is some 35, 40 pages, I believe, is at this link, okay? Um, and here is my contact information. You can always reach out to me. If I don't have the information, I will find it for you or find somebody who does. Um, so feel free. Again, it is my job to help you and teach you to have a greater impact in the community. So thank you for your attention and your time. And uh, our next series session is going to be, help me out, Diane, the 6th of December. This December 6th, we will talk about fundraising readiness, okay? What you need to do and have in place to be ready to raise money. Um, 6.30 again, I hope you'll join us and happy Thanksgiving to everyone. See you in December, I hope. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. So much, Thank Angela. you. Thank you so much. Happy Thanksgiving.
Thank you, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving.